In this video, I'm going to explain the role of what's called confirmatory testing for a medical condition, like a virus, and its impact on the probability that a person will be determined to have the condition when they don't. In other words, the probability of a false positive diagnosis. This is especially pertinent for testing a virus like COVID-19. The numbers I'm going to use in this example are for illustration purposes only and are not intended to represent what's currently known for any particular medical condition. For simplicity, we assume that a person either is or is not infected and that a test for the condition will either be positive or negative. So we can think of these as variables where the test result is dependent on whether or not the person is infected. Now we assume that a random person in the population has a 1% chance of being infected. That's what the 1% represents here. And as far as the test result is concerned, well this is dependent on whether or not they're infected. And so there are so-called conditional probabilities associated with this, which represent the test accuracy. So what this is actually saying is that if a person is not infected, there's a 2% false positive rate, which of course means that for 98% of the people who are not infected, it will correctly give a negative result, but for 2%, it will give this incorrect positive result. There's also the probability of a false negative. So there's a 20% chance that a person who is infected will get a negative result, but for 80% of the people who are infected, they will correctly get a positive result. Now, because I'm using a Bayesian network tool here, when I enter an observation, like a person getting a negative test result, and run the model, it automatically updates the probability of them being infected. So in this case, we're now almost certain that they're not infected if they get a negative result. If they get a positive result, again, Bayes' theorem is applied automatically here when I run the model. The probability is significantly increased. It's gone from 1% to nearly 29%, but it's still unlikely that they are infected. And that's because of that combination of the low prior probability of being infected and the false positive probability of 2%. So it makes perfect sense in such situations to do a second confirmatory test. So I've now made a copy of that node here, which is a test result. You can see this is exactly the same. It's got exactly the same conditional probabilities here. If I assume that these are genuinely independent, then if I run a second test here and get a positive result, there's a very high probability that with the second confirmatory positive test result that the person is infected. And that gives a very good justification for doing confirmatory testing. If I set this back to what it was before, let's just check those false positives again. So if a person is not infected, independently, as we know, they both have a 2% probability of a false positive. And the probability that they're both positive is simply the product of those two probabilities, which is 0.04%. And so now, the overall false positive rate when we're doing confirmatory testing is much lower. It's only 0.04%. And that, of course, justifies the confirmatory testing because we actually have an incredibly low overall false positive rate. Now, of course, whether or not a person is infected and even tested depends on factors like whether they had a known recent contact with a COVID positive person, whether they've got some immunity, because we're representing this as a causal Bayesian network, the direction of the arrows goes from cause to effect here. So whether or not you've had recent contact with a COVID positive person directly influences whether you've been infected. And similarly, whether or not you're immune directly affects whether you've been infected. And similarly, whether or not you're infected directly influences whether or not you've got symptoms. In this case, if we know that the person was in recent contact with a COVID positive person, so we enter true there, we run the model, there's already a much higher prior probability that the person is infected. If they've also got symptoms, that prior probability goes up to 
So in this case, if we do just one test and that test is positive, we're actually almost certain the person is infected. So there's no need to do a second test in this case. On the other hand, if we don't know that the person was in recent contact with a COVID positive person and they have no symptoms, then the prior probability of being infected actually goes down. And in this case, the positive test result makes us even less sure first time round the person's infected. And even with a second positive test result here, we're only 90% sure they're infected. And if the second result was negative, then it's very unlikely that they were infected. Now in practice, it's highly unlikely that tests can be truly independent. And that's why in this version of the model, I've got a direct link from the first test to the second test. And the second test might be dependent on the first test for a number of different reasons. For example, we might be using the same sample which could have been contaminated, or it might just be inevitable confirmation bias, whereby there's a natural human inclination to be more likely to judge the second result as positive if the first was positive. And in this case, the a second positive is less decisive. So for example, let's run the model with a positive result on the first test. So as before, about 28% infected. But because that was positive, there's now a much higher probability a second result is also going to be positive. So indeed, when the second result comes back positive, although we're now fairly confident the person infected, we're nowhere near the 99% that we were when there was independence between these two tests. And we can also see the overall impact of that in terms of the overall false positive result. So now look at, let's look at the situation where the person isn't infected and we look at the probability of the false positives here. Well, we know the first test has got a 2% false positive rate, but the overall false positive rate now, instead of being 0.04%, has gone up. It's still low, but it's 0.2% compared with 0.04%. So there's still massive benefit in doing confirmatory testing in this case, but you need to be aware that the overall false positive rate is not as low as it was when there's the assumption of independence between the two tests. It's also possible that even if there's no direct dependence between the two tests themselves, there could be some systematic cause of errors, such as, for example, problems with the test equipment itself or problems in the lab. In this case, the way I have to find the effect of that systematic common error is that you can see that if there's no common error, then the conditional probability for the test result is exactly as it was before. But if there is systematic common error, then basically the test result tells us nothing. It's just as likely to be negative as positive result, irrespective of what the true state of the person is. And we're assuming here there's a 1% probability of systematic common error. So in this case, person test positive. The problems that are infected, again, is, at, is now a bit lower than the previous examples. That's because the positive result here increases the probability there could be some systematic common error. The second result is positive. There's even more chance of systematic common error because positive results are fairly rare so they're more likely when there's some systematic common error. So again the overall effect is that there's still now quite a high probability the person is infected. Okay but again not as high as the previous occasions. So even in this case, there are still significant benefits in doing confirmatory testing, but the overall results, again, are not as powerful. We can again see what the overall false positive rate is by assuming that a person is not affected. And in this case, we can see that we've got these higher independent probabilities of the test results being false positives. And in this case, the overall false positive rate is 0.29%. So it's still pretty good, but again, it's not as good as the previous cases, but it still merits the confirmatory testing.
I should also point out that we have developed a full diagnostic model, which includes multiple factors. Different types of symptoms, different types of tests. Underlying medical conditions. And you can run this model yourself over the web using the link provided here.